Right, so Michael, you are the son of John Austin. Yep. Limited. Limited. Would I say the future boss? Oh, I don't I've know heard, if I'm the I've future heard, boss. Heard it's going to skip a generation. Yeah, I might skip generation. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I'll probably almost reach the peak and then have to go back to driving, I think. Yeah. <laughs> At the minute you're in operations. Yeah, operations. Run, running the day to day of the business. Yeah, so harvesters and silaging and all that sort of stuff. Myself. Richard and um, Neil. Neil does all like the earthworks and the truck operations and Richard does all the spraying and the drilling and the cultivation so it works quite well that we can focus on our different areas. So we're just going to have a look around the air today yep. and see yep. what you have going on. Yeah, yep. No, there's always stuff going on. So, so behind us is like the, f the original shed that's where it all started. Yeah, the original uh, half round hay barn. Dad will tell you more about the business but, but it was initially a dairy farm and he bought it and he got into machinery and, and went from there really. It's been going for about 40 years so the whole yard's all just sort of been added on as, it, as it's growing. Now at the minute I don't think we're allowed into that shed of this camera because it's like a top top secret lab for yeah, Kemper engineers. Yeah it's top secret lab in there so we'll probably get shot if we go in there but so yeah. So you do a lot, of, a lot of testing for Kemper and John Deere? Yep, yep, yep. We've always had John Deere harvesters and, and Kemper attachments, you know, when we first started doing silage it was four row Kempers on reverse steer fence and then got into the old self propel forage harvesters and yeah, always, always run them, they're a good machine and you know, we're pretty challenging conditions over here so, and it works well with the engineer seasons to come out here and you know, work out what works and doesn't before they go back to Germany. Then obviously, besides the office where, where the operations happen. Yeah, yeah, we like to say that's the nervous centre of the, <laughs> of the company. Uh, it's Who's all, the nervous one? <laughs> oh, we're all nervous, mate. It gets pretty hectic uh, when it gets going. Um, yeah, when every, everyone's out and about and flying around, uh, lots of moving pieces and lots of machines. So, um, yeah, as you know yourself, machines always uh, can give you trouble right when you least want them to. Yeah, obviously have a workshop down here. Yeah, so we got the main workshop here, parts room, service bay for oils and filters and all that sort of stuff. So rainy day today, busy catching up with a few services on some machines. Boys get stuck in and get the oils changed and whatnot on days like today. So this is cultivation shed I'm guessing? Yeah, so this is the planter shed, drill shed, combine shed, combine sh aren't in here at the moment. One's in the main workshop getting set up for corn and full rebuild on the on the corn heads. So yeah, pretty much um, through the winter the planters take over this area, strip them right back, rebuild them and all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, over the summer it's the drills turn and the combines turn and the cycle goes on. So yeah. So we've got um, a bit of We've got a bit of everything. We've got a bedner, we've got, I don't know what that green machine is. Is that a homemade machine by any chance? It's quite a non-factory John Deere planter, let's say. <laughs> it's got a bit of everything on it. I don't know how long we would have had it for, but it's uh, been modified just about every year for probably 15 years or whatever. So yeah, yeah there's not much standard about it. We've always been John Deere planters and um, you know, make them work for what we need them to do. And we've got two Vardastad eight rows now, which are going really well, pretty impressed with them. You know, so how many maize planters do you run altogether? Four? We run four, four maize planters. <laughs> and so how much maize are you 
planting and chopping every year? Um, I assume you chop everything you plant. No, we do a lot of we do do a lot for grain. Oh so yeah, yeah. It, it varies on the year. It varies on the year. So yeah, be anywhere from you know 500 to 800 odd hectares of grain, and um, yeah, silage depends on the year too. So you probably get up to around 3,000, over 3,000 hectares of maize silage. Yeah. So over here you have maize silage and maize corn, whereas back in Ireland we only have maize silage. Yeah, we so we go to maize corn. Yeah, yeah, yes. Well, I guess grain was probably the grassroots uh, of this operation. You know, we, uh, Dad started with one tractor and one combine and grew the business from there. Back in the day, silage wasn't a, as big a thing. You know, whereas yeah. dairy's really taken off now, and so silage has definitely taken over. So then I'm looking at two John Deere's with blades on the front. Yep. For pushing maize, you yep. don't run any wheel loaders. No, no wheel loaders. I mean, look at that rig right there, what more could you want? <laughs> you know, just a honey, so. Jerry, our friendly Irishman, giving us the way. Biggest grassman fan around, he tells me. <laughs> Too shy to come on camera though. So we'll what's the him. reason for running tractors and blades instead of a, at least one wheel loader? You know, I think the wheel loaders would be really good. Um, Typically we run two harvesters for grass all year round. They'll c come over to maize for the maize season and then back into grass. The versatility with a tractor is, you know, you can drop it off and do cultivation or something if you're not, not doing grass. Um, and yeah, we've just always always run the buck rakes back in the day, you know, 78.10s and, and whatever. And um, yeah, well, we just love the love the tractors for the stack, you know, the blade and maze is just real cool. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice big heavy tractor, good footprint, we can really cover the ground and move the materials, so yeah, that's that's what we find. We run um, well we've got six or seven tractors set up for stacking, so And they don't find the blade awkward in grass silage? The blades all park up. We've got five buck rakes. Push off buck rakes. Push off buck yeah, rakes, yeah. so you know, two of them work. Um, all year round, grass and maize, and, and then the other three are just when we need them really, if we need to get a third chopper out for grass or, or whatever, and the blades will do. We've got one blade that can do push dirt around and whatever, and then another blade that just does maize. But you know, we've always had big tractors for cultivation and para harrowing and you know, discing and whatnot, and then you get to this time of year and you can't utilise that machine, so you put it on the stack and yeah, it yeah. does a really good keeps job. Keeps moving all year round. Yeah, keeps yeah. moving all year round, yep. John Deere behind us. A lot of John Deere's around at the minute, but you're about 50-50 Fenton John Deere. Yeah, we'd be you? about half and half Fenton John Deere. You know, they're both real, real nice tractors. I don't think you can go wrong with either of them, so. So would you be typically like fenting the bigger horsepowers and John Deere and the smaller horsepowers or? Um, well, I think we've got about about nine, eight hundreds now. Um, we find they're a really good size universal tractor, all eight two fours and two eight two sixes now. And yeah, they're just really universal. Um, the John Deere though, you know, Green Star and all that GPS systems, I don't think you can go past it. You know, they've always been a leader in that field. And so we typically run all John Deere and all the precision operations of the business. And yeah, fence tractors are really good for mowing and power herring and trailer work, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So there's a 7R down here and it looks very, very shiny. Yes, she's just new? turned up. She's brand new. <coughs> yep. So I uh, got her in January. John Deere have really upped their game on comfort and the look of the machines, I think now the up yeah, the, the game sevens. and up the price tag too, you know. Yeah. For, but um, <laughs> still not still not up the Fent money, I suppose. So. Uh, oh, well, they're pretty competitive around yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. But like I said, you know, they're both both good machines and great service from both dealers. Really, both fantastic service. So this is on a blade now for me. Is yep. What will this particular tractor will do? And so this this one will go. This one will pull our twelve row planter. When the planting's finished, we'll put it on a side dresser. So we'll knife urea into the ground and also into row spray. When the maize is coming up, we'll put it on row crops for that. What about trucks then? Are you running many trucks? <clears throat> yeah, we've got a few trucks. Nissans and Hinos and UDs and whatnot. We've Just for silage and maize carting? Yeah, or do we're predominantly work? maize and grass silage contracting. And, you know, we move a lot of bales and, and grain from the combine as well. So. Um, you know, the trucks have to be pretty rugged for what we put them through in these yeah. conditions. 
you know, or off, off in the paddocks all day long. They take a pretty, they have a pretty hard life. Yeah. The likes of the A24 behind us then, like she's on dual wheels there now, is she be a planting tractor again? No, so that uh, this is Jerry's tractor and this is um, stacking all year round. So that setup is basically what will run for 12 months a year and he will uh, do an odd bit of power herring or disking but mainly it just stays like that. And yeah, because you're chopping 12 months of the year. Not fully 12 months of the year, you know, um, winter time we normally don't do a lot but the last few years we've sort of kept going a bit but it's not much, it's you know, yeah, yeah. one or two jobs a month but it still feels like you're chopping still all year counts. round, still eh? counts. it still <laughs> counts but the last few years have been a bit different to normal so yeah. we'll see what happens this year. They're so, a good little machine, them little John oh, Deere. Uh, I wish they hadn't stopped making it, I, yeah. I mean yeah, she's been here for a long time now, I remember as a small kid when it first turned up and thought that was pretty cool and it's still pretty cool and it's on its last legs and somehow just keeps going. No, po no, point, no point getting rid of it now. No, can't kill it. <laughs> so yeah, it just stays around the yard here and it's always very handy. Yeah, yeah. So what is in here, a couple of chaser bins? Yeah, a couple of chaser bins or grain carts as we call them down yeah, here. Yeah. So my you bad, probably, my you bad. probably heard that before. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty sure we made that name up before the Australians did, but <laughs> I don't know, so... Um, and then what's going on back there? There's a tank on the front of that bin. Yeah, so we've got these conveyals, um, we call them, as, or you know, seed tender. So we're all granular fertiliser in our planters. With every planter we have a seed tender or, or fertiliser and chemical, because we spray, we do all our pre-emergence on the planter. Oh yeah. Saves going back over the top of the field with the, with the sprayer after the fact. So these guys will carry fertiliser and chemical and seed, so when the plant is empty, it's loaded and gone again, you know, yeah. try to minimise downtime in the field. And then we have a baby fent over here. Yeah, the little mighty 411. Um, yeah, she's been here for a long time, and I guess once, you know, you've got to keep some of those old fence around because they're just good tractors, aren't they, really? I heard there's an A20 that you're there is an A20, to get rid of. yep. It's just sitting over there behind the um, 6430. We're not allowed to get rid of that. Um, Max drives that, he would have worked for us for probably 14, maybe even 15 years now. I'm not allowed to say how old he is, but he said when we sell his tractor he's retiring. And so he said, right, we just won't sell it then. <laughs> and then he said that, oh well, when the tyres wear out, I'll retire. So he put new tyres on it that week and um, I guess we'll keep replacing the tyres before they even wear out. So He must God, be a good operator then. Oh, he's a good operator on Max. He, he, He's been around and he, know, he knows what he's doing, so, <laughs> yeah. And then we have another 800 with a buck rake. Yep, yep, so his sister tractor to, to Jerry's tractor, so, yep. We love the, the rollers on the back, for especially for grass, they do a fantastic job. Yeah, yeah. You know, get it in really tight and make it look really nice, so. And obviously bring up the weight as well for rolling, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Compaction is key. <coughs> What's hiding back there, then? Well, there's a few things hiding back there. There's a lot of things hiding in there that I don't even know what they are because <laughs> they're probably well before my time. Yeah. But uh, there's a couple of cool old tractors in there, that's for sure. That was um, the first tractor Dad ever drove, a Ford 5000 in there. He would have been baling hay around the countryside when he was 11 or 12 on that machine. So, yeah, it's quite cool that we've, we've still got it. And then... The rest of the shed is all bits of machinery. Yeah, mostly implements and whatnot. Green line stuff. So yeah. what are you running in green line stuff? There's a bit of everything there. Is there coon class? Yeah, so we got uh, two coon round balers this year. They've gone really well. Happy with the bale that they make. You know, real nice bale with 3D wrapping and, and uh, the ability to run all the same plastic uh, makes, makes life a lot simpler. So yeah, yeah. really happy with that. Crone square baler. And what's, does it, a gow eel wrapper, yes. is that for big squares or yep, for... big squares, yeah. yep. Not really doing a lot of square bales anymore, they've sort of died out a bit up here. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's still the, the odd job that we go and do. Just so. keep the one baler for yeah, bits and pieces. Yeah, keep the one baler for it. Yeah. And then we have a spray truck and a couple oh, of spray yes. tractors, are you doing a lot of spraying? Yeah, we do all our own spraying. Um, just then you've got control on when you can get 
get to a place, you know, you're not relying on getting another contractor in or something. The spray truck's really good, um, doesn't get used all year round, but it's nice and handy if you've got to duck away far away, you know, nice and quick on the road to get there and get in and get out. The JCB does a fantastic job, you know, uh, getting around the countryside and a nice machine on the road and yeah, the spray yeah, does a lot yeah. of road work. Is that the so only fast track in the it's fleet? It's the only fast track in the fleet. <coughs> is yeah. it the only non fent or John Deere tractor in the fleet? It is the only non fent and John Deere. Save the Ford 5000, uh, we're all fent and John Deere. Yeah. yeah. How many tractors is there in the fleet? Oh, I haven't had a count up, but I think it's around 30. Around 30. But you can't quote me on that, but I think it's around 30. Yeah, yeah. Give yeah. or take a few. Is that a corn mill back there or something? Yeah. So, roll mill grain bagger. We can crush maize grain, put it into bags as a crusher, and also we've got a whole grain bagger too. Yeah, but those machines work really well, especially on a year where the silos are full and all you can't sell it. You know, we can store it ourselves and then move it on when we need to. You gonna do your big interview, Kellogg's? I bet you he's only cleaning that tractor because I'm here yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's panicking now. Give us a look at that cab there, see what it's like. Oh, better be good, Kellogg's. Oh, oh, nice. we're getting dirt. Yeah, he's doing a good job now. <laughs> <laughs> so more tractors here. More tractors, yep. You have a bit of a selection of trailers. You've Bergmans, Herons. Bergmans, Herons and Gill Traps. Um, a New Zealand company design and build them for us. We love the Bergmans, they're a fantastic trailer. Hydraulic suspension, really good. Chain floor, Yeah. you know, don't have to worry about putting a hoist up at the stack side or when it sinks, having to tip it up to get the load out or whatever, it's nice and easy just to push it out. Yeah. And then, is that a wagon I spot up there? It is a wagon you spot up there. Shooter make a wagon. Really have you got many of them? Wagon. We've got one. Um, and one Bergman loader wagon. Do they run with choppers or they have, is it, are they um, their own crew like? Mostly they will run to take the load off the choppers sometimes or a smaller job where a guy wants, wants a loader wagon they'll run. I like uh, in the annuals running one loader wagon with a forager crew you know just for any wetter areas that they need to duck in and get or steeper yeah. bits or metal detections. Yeah yeah um, just leave it there and leave the wagon worry about it. Yeah, yeah let yeah. the wagon worry about it so Really, we like both of them really. The Shooter Maker is a fantastic wagon, um, real simple, and the pickup for our conditions is great. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, the Bergman's the same as our trailers, it's, it's a good wagon too. Yeah. So. so, this is the real future boss here, is it? This yeah. is the real future boss. It's going to skip a generation. Yeah, Smart. skip a generation, <laughs> indeed. So, she's the boss. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> So she loves tractors, which is great. So it means I can retire early. <laughs> right, so we have the chopper shed. Yes. The up next. Am I allowed shed. in there? Oh, we can go in there. It's fine. You're, you are on a test head, all right, but I can't really Yeah, yeah, no, don't, don't worry about that. Partly how the business has grown, and I guess if we did it again, you'd build one big workshop and have everything in the one workshop. But yeah. as it's been a step-by-step -step progression from two machines to how many we got now, everything's sort of tacked on, but it works quite well having, you know, combines and planters and drills, and then the chopper boys have their own space to work up here too. This workshop's just for the chopper boys. Good stock, spare parts. Yep, yep. Is that of. like, a are they all your own spare parts? Like that's not test off or anything like or? No, there's probably some parts on there that were test parts that they've just left here, or, or there's lots of gearboxes and spout extensions and KPs and whatever, so yeah, yeah, we um, we're quite far away from the factory here, so John Deere normally has a really good stock of parts, but um, if they don't have something, you've got a long wait time. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So then this is an 8600i. Yep. Your biggest chopper is an 8700i. 97. Oh yeah, 97. Oh, she's an 8600. Yeah. yeah. Is this the demo one? No. No. This is your own one. Yep. Yeah, this yeah. is the own one. So. Well, are you running all 12 row heads this no. year? No, well for the last few years we've had a 12 row and three 10 rows and whatnot and when we bought this chopper it come with an 8 row. Yeah, we've got one 8 row now and three 10 rows and a 12 row. Yeah. So we've got a spearhead for our 7000 which we've turned into an 8 row this year with all the down maze. So oh, it's worked yeah, out yeah. quite handy because uh, 8 row seems to do really well with the down stuff. Yeah, so is that a big problem for you this year after the cyclone? Uh, hit the North Island, like were you badly affected or did you get away lightly around here? 
Um, oh, I guess we would say we're badly affected, but we're definitely not as affected as some. So yeah. um, we're very fortunate that we've got a lot of maize still standing, but um, I guess we've been chopping for two weeks now or whatever, and most of that is we've been trying to get the down stuff off, and we've still got down stuff to do. So yeah. it's a long, slow process and frustrating for everyone. It's frustrating for the drivers and myself and hard for the farmers too, you know. Just got to do the best we can. So this is your main workshop then? Yeah, this is the main workshop. Even this has been added on to, you can see the main building and then we tacked the lean-to onto it. And How many combines do you have? Two. Two, two combines. combines. 9770 and S670. So. Or should I call them headers? Do you call them headers? No, no, combines. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. We've got just, that from America. Just in the South <laughs> Island are headers? Just, yeah, 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 yeah. We've, uh, Dad especially has had a lot of uh, grass fruits in America too, so. Yeah, we're a bit of a mishmash of everything here between the Germans <laughs> that come over every year and the Americans and the Europeans. I'm glad we can agree on that one anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> How many mechanics or fitters would you have here working? Not enough. Yeah. It's hard to get mechanics. Yeah, um, yeah we've got a truck mechanic and then uh, our main mechanics also doubles as the workshop foreman as well. But we try to give everyone basic selection of tool. The overseas boys come with a bit of experience from home and working on stuff. Yeah, would a lot of guys do their own repairs and or just bits and pieces? Sort yeah, of as much as we can, you know, we try to. I mean, seems we're always under pressure, so when the pressure's really on, that's when the dealers will come in and help. But, yeah. you know, if we've got the time and we can do it ourselves, we'll try to do it ourselves. What's this machine behind you here now? Soil Warrior is not a brand I'm familiar with. Yep, it's an American brand, American company, strip tillage machine. So this is for strip tilling in front of the maize planter? Yep. Yeah, uh, strip tilling's really taken off over here. I guess oh, this machine's probably almost 20 years old, I think now, but um, now everyone seems to be loving it. It's, you know, environmentally friendly. Or it's also really good on our hills for erosion. Yeah. and whatnot, you know, um, rather than conventional tillage. It works really well, being able to put fertiliser down in the zone and then the GPS systems are working pretty good now with the steering draw bars and everything on following each other. Normally with this machine, it's a disc, wavy disc design, and so you'll have to do one to two passes normally in, in a field before you uh, plant it, as opposed to the other type that's really common now and quite popular is the 4-0 rotary hose strip tool. Yeah. with the planter on behind so but this is good for you know different fertilizer applications it's got two tanks and high rates of fertilizer you're not short of grass or maize headers anyway around here no <laughs> no and they uh well you never know when you're going to need them yeah 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 and then i've so, seen a bit of gr class green line stuff and two two massy rakes yes yes so um we're all class mowers i don't know if you could get us to change from them they're a fantastic yeah, yeah. mower why change something that's not broke, you know? Yeah. I, I wouldn't think of changing. The abuse they take over here is unreal. Yeah. It's the same as the class rakes too. They go out and they come back every day. And you might have to fix a bit on them at the end of the day, but they haven't held the whole job up. So that's the main thing. How did the two Massey rakes come about? Um, two Massey rakes, we used a good price. And simple and it was the year that we couldn't get overseas guys with COVID. So we had a lot of Kiwi staff and be at the two rotor rakes seem to take a lot of punishment and um <laughs> so we got two of them that had been a good rake to be fair oh indeed but that's all the sheds we've seen really then yep yep that's all the sheds there's more stuff scattered around the place these are just implements and whatnot down here and when we get every when we get a break at the end of maize we'll get everything out and get it washed up and put away ready to start again yeah. so yeah it's a never-ending cycle Lovely job. Mm. Well, Michael, thanks very much for having me. No, Show no me worries. Around. Thanks for coming. Watching the sky. It really is. <laughs> so, John, what can you tell us about history with John Austin Contracting? Um, How did it all start? Um, I guess I was keen on machinery when I was a kid. Used to ride around with local contractors and their 
back in those days it was maize grains so they were combining and there were some contractors doing grass silage but not a lot a lot of farmers did their own um, grass silage and hay and uh, one of the local farmers did some conventional baling around the district and I started working for him when I was 11 and started driving his Ford 5000 and New Holland baler and did a whole lot of baling around the district before police were worried about children uh, on the road. But I was um, desperately loved tractors and contracting. One day I was riding in a combine with a chap, Peter Hoare, who was a contractor that harvested maize locally. And he said, well, when you leave school, uh, come and work for me. And so I said, right. But he said, you've got to get school C maths and school C book, bookkeeping, accounting. So I said, rightio. So I did that, rang him up and said, right, when do I start? So I worked for him for about five years. and. After that, I bought the combine and a tractor from him and carried on the, his business as John Austin Limited. And so he retired? Uh, yes, from contracting, yes. It was pretty natural for me because I was already doing all the driving and all the work for the customers. And then uh, probably 91 or 92, we only had about five tractors. And I keep blaming Jackie that we've gr grown so, so many tractors because of her love of tractors, but uh, she will dispute that. When the maize silage industry started, we were doing a lot of direct drilling back then for dairy farmers and still doing the maize grain and um, barley and wheat harvesting. We ended up very busy that season, so the next season we bought a self-propelled John Deere forager and uh, we ended up being very busy. Both those years we were running them 24 hours a day. We decided we'd buy two so we didn't have to work 24 hours a day and we ended up running both those 24 hours a day so anyway that's how it went on for quite a few years <laughs> uh, we're very good at solving the problem of having to work 24 hours a day we still seem to have to do that but anyway occasionally we don't do that as much today but so now we're up to four now, top, yeah, now we run range foragers and your four forage harvesters and uh and uh, they just do it as a leisurely pace. Michael probably doesn't feel that way, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the pressure's on Michael now to make it happen. And, and so, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's incredible. I, I um, tease the, um, you know, the Kemp guys, that, uh, why, didn't, why didn't you sell me this head the last time you sold me the head? You know, they, yeah. the machines just get better and better and better. And, uh, you know, one of the things that just way more reliable and more productive. The pressure and the challenge of it hasn't changed. It's uh, still very demanding at different times. Where did the relationship with John Deere start off? Because obviously, like, you do all the the testing of new John Deere foragers and maize heads and, well, well I presume grass heads. We in have my first close relationship with the factory was with a combine, and uh, we bought the first 9000 series combine that, Harvester Works in the States exported and and so they had a little bit of a challenge with the release of that and they they I I as a young guy I used to go to the States like Michael did I, I never worked for a whole season because I was busy working back here um, but I got to know some custom cutters over there that were running test machines for John Deere so I got to know the engineers from Harvester Works just through my contacts in the states and so they thought of me they needed to resolve an issue and and so they called me and and they sent the engineers out so we, we tested combines for a long time and corn heads and forage harvesters i'm not sure how that started I, I i think we started testing some components my friend in northern germany was also working closely with the engineering department and that was probably part of the reason with forage harvesters as well. They rang me up and wanted me to test a, an eight row Kemper head. We were just running the six rows back then and eight rows seemed way too big for me. I sort of said no, that we wouldn't do that, it's too big. And I talked to my friend in Northern Germany and he said, no, they're fantastic, you should try it. So I said to Kemper in the end, I said, right here, we'll do it. But if it doesn't work, we, you've got a guarantee you'll cut it down to a six row, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so but, you know, we, we, we probably were one of the first to have triple mowers and, and um, four rotor rakes and all the rest of it. So I've always sort of tried to not limit ourselves with scale or size. We, 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 you've got to be open-minded to new stuff and, and to do it. So we've always been keen to work with them and, 
and do that and it's been a good relationship we've certainly enjoyed it so you're planning on staying with john deere for a long long time are there other types of forest? <laughs> <laughs> shots fired <laughs> uh, but you don't have a full fleet of john deere tractors no so no, you like no, the fence no. as well um, it, it just proves we've got good taste you know um I think the Fent is a really good product and we've got a really good dealer, but you know, if I was really honest, we're, we're John Deere at heart. We've got a really good John Deere dealer and we've got a really good Fent dealer and I think we're pretty fortunate. I, th I think the class dealer is a great dealer too and uh, you know, and I hate to say it, but probably a good product as well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, no, they're all good gear and, and they're all doing a great job. Mm. But tell me this now, if the opportunity came up to try out a Fent Katana forager, would you try one? Because I don't think they have them in New Zealand yet. No, no, no. Would we try one? I, I wouldn't. It's You see, if we were to change from John Deere, that's a really big step. But, but if we were running class, it's equally as big a step because part of the value of what of running the gear is knowing it and knowing how to maintain it and we have spare kps and and a, a lot of spares so to change a brand is is bigger than the it's a bigger move than just yeah, changing yeah, colors yeah. of of the equipment um in some ways it, it would be nicer to just to have one brand of tractor yeah um because then everything's the same and everything you're doing and uh but you know, we we went to Fent Vario's for um, for mowing and that before John Deere had that sort of uh, equipment. So in a lot of ways, uh, they can be quite a different tractor. Do you run Green Star on everything, or do you have your Green Star and John Deere's and then your Fent GPS separate, or what way do you do it? We've got Green Star in one of the Fents, and we've got Trimble and some of the others. So. For instance, mowing or, or swathing or, or doing something like that, fertiliser spreading. It's, it doesn't matter, but when we're planting maize or, or doing that sort of stuff, we like it on the John Deere system, really. Yeah, just to keep everything the same. Yeah. And John Deere have done a fantastic job of their GPS um, equipment and, and, you know, they've led the pack as far as we think um, yeah. for a while. So it's been good for us to to stay with that and then you've a good few overseas staff yes so you have irish english germans we've got a canadian american welsh you people from that uk part of the world get quite sensitive when you we sort of lump you all together it's uh yeah yeah <laughs> We we th we see you as just being neighbours, you know, yeah, of yeah, each yeah. other. But yeah. <laughs> we're all imports. Yeah. <laughs> but how did you start off with the imports? Um, or how long ago was it? A long time ago. I in fact. Like, would you have been one of the first to be bringing in yes, the I outside think so. workers as well? Yes, definitely. It was because I did a lot of travel, mm. and so I'd travel to the UK, and and um, one of the first was a friend's brother came out with his friend and then you know I had a couple of Dutch people that concrete path around my office was put down by these two Dutch boys so back in those days we only had a couple and they used to live with us so that was before I was married they stayed at home with my, my mother and and um, I and and then before we had children all the guys would stay with us at home we've got three three there now staying with us and um so yeah, well, it was that was a long time ago. I don't know how long uh, Ian Ian Chu would probably know remember how long that was, but that was that would be over thirty years ago. I would say could be thirty five years ago even. Yeah. Yeah, long long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> that'll probably do us, John. Yes, oh, that's good. Thanks for having me. No, you're very welcome. Can't you hear?